morning. How are we feeling at 11 o'clock? We feeling good? Everybody good? Great. Well, my name is John. It's a thrill to be with you here today, whether you call Life Church home or you're just checking us out for the first time. Thanks for being here. Faith is a journey, not a guilt trip. So we started this church about 10 years ago from scratch. We had no money, no people, no building, and no clue. And uh, in about 10 years, this is what's happened. We've taken over this old golf store and uh, taken something and turned it into a place where you can investigate, feel through, probe your faith without feeling like you're the one that got probed. So uh, thrilled to have you here. Thanks for being here. Take a look around for just a second. Look around you. Look behind you. Notice that there's a lot of people here in this space, which is really exciting. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. We're, we're thrilled to have you here. And it's going to continue to be kind of packed uh, now until Easter, which is this month. More and more people are going to come because they're looking for a place to connect with God. So here's how you can help us out. If you are able to come to our 930 gathering. There's many more open seats there, a lot more space to spread out, stretch your legs. Uh, and if you come at 930, that opens up seats for first-time guests who are coming at 11. So uh, just something to throw out there, especially if you don't have young children. Uh, you can start your Sunday off earlier, go at 930, then head out to Bob Evans afterwards for breakfast, get some pancakes. It'd be great. All right. So we are uh, starting a new series it's called The Elephant in the Room. Turn to someone next to you and say, The Elephant in the Room. We went to the Detroit Zoo to go see all the animals. I've got five kids, and we just love the animal kingdom. I love the penguins. We went to the Detroit Zoo, and they've got this new penguin exhibit. And I just like the way that they, they kind of waddle. It's like they're constipated birds. And then they... <laughs> They dive into the water and they kind of swim around. I just could watch penguins all day. Then we moved over to the monkeys, the little spider monkeys, you know, and they're just like, hey, what's up? Let it all hang out. And then uh, you got the meerkats. How many of you have ever seen meerkats before? Those guys are so awesome. They're like in the hole and then they come out, back in the hole, you know, come out, oh, oh, back in the hole, kind of like a teenager. It's great. So, um, we're seeing all these animals, and then my daughter came upon the elephant, elephants, which are the, the huge, majestic, powerful animals. They take up a lot of space, but they don't get as much uh, of the, the love. We, we like to talk about these small little animals that, that kind of dot around and jump around, but we don't ever address the elephant in the room. And, and so what this series is about is addressing... The elephant in the room. And here's what I can promise you. This is going to be an uncomfortable message. <laughs> it is. It's going to be a tad in your face. All right? If you were looking for just a casual, easygoing message, no, not the Sunday for that. This one, you can stick out your foot, look at your foot, and then imagine that I'm stepping on your toes. That's what this message is. It's a little controversial. It's so controversial. That during the 9.30 gathering, we did have some people walk out. I kid you not. I was only five minutes into the message, and I see this whole back row, stand up, we're getting out of here. <laughs> and they just headed out, and they went to Hope Vale. So, um, <laughs> anyhow, I, I hope that today's message encourages you. I hope that it, it really transforms an area of your life. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not interested in casual Christianity. I, I have no use for that in my life. I don't want to play church. I want to be the church. And so sometimes that means we have to address the elephant in the room. There's fill in the blank notes on the Life Michigan app if you want to pull that up on your smartphone. Uh, and while you're on your smartphone, pull up your Facebook and check in to Life Church Saginaw. You can use this hashtag, take the test. That's the name of today's message. If I had to boil it down to a hashtag, it would be take the test. So, about 50 years ago, there was a missionary, a young man in his 20s named Jim Elliott. He went to South America to reach 
an unreached tribal group. And within just a few weeks of arriving there with his young family, Jim Elliott was killed by the very tribes people he was trying to reach with the gospel. One of his most famous quotes is this quote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Maybe you want to share that on Facebook. You could take a snapshot of that. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And that sets the tone for where we're headed. If you've got a Bible, you can open up to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6 is where we're at. The Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon by Jesus. He's literally on a mount overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are sitting on the ground, you know, crisscross applesauce. They are just drinking in everything Jesus has to say. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then he gets to Matthew 6, which is the, the biggest chunk of his message, where he is going to talk about the elephant in the room. In other words, Jesus talks about money. And all the oxygen in the room went, <laughs> everybody just kind of went, wait a second, what did I just walk into? I was just coming here to this church. My girlfriend told me to come to this church, and now they're talking about money. They just want my money. Calm down. We don't want your money. All right? We're not after your money. Do you know who's after your money? Target. <laughs> Amazon.com. Even Flip and Meyer down the road. They're after your money, and you don't stop going there. Today, we're talking about the elephant in the room, money, but I'm prefacing it by saying we're not after your money. In fact, if you're new today, if you've been coming just for a little while, you can completely ignore this message. It is not for you. This message is just for folks who are, are a little down the road in their faith, they're a little more mature in their faith, and they really want to find and fully follow Jesus with their lives. Because Jesus talked about money more than heaven and hell combined. The reason why is he knew that it's about our hearts. And our hearts are trapped. Our hearts get chained up. Our hearts get weighed down by the stress and anxiety of trying to get more money. So, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 Jesus said this, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them, rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And then he gets to verse 21, which it's kind of like the theme verse for this whole series of messages. I, I would print this verse out and put it on your fridge, put it on your bathroom mirror so you see it over and over again. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So I have here on the stage... A treasure chest from the 1930s. It's old, it's ancient, it's rusty. And I have a heart. Not a human heart, that would be weird. <laughs> I'd go trending on YouTube for the wrong reason. <laughs> Local pastor pulls it. No. So I got this heart. Look at this. Isn't this cute? This, this goes in the pool. This is the heart. This represents you and me. We all have a heart. We all have the core of our personhood what it is that we're passionate about, what it is that makes us laugh, what we dream about, what we focus on, what we stress about, what we stay up late at night worrying about. The heart controls who we are. And Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And for us as Americans, we're capitalists, 
So we are always consumed with our possessions. Wherever your treasure is, your heart, your core identity is going to get wrapped up in it. Jesus is not after your money. Jesus is after your heart. He doesn't want some of you. Jesus wants all of you. He wants your whole heart. We are on a journey to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And so, part of that journey is addressing the elephant in the room and asking the question, where do I invest my resources? If I'm a gamer, then I probably have two, three screens. I probably have a private room for gaming. I got my special headphones, my special chair that moves with the sounds, right? Uh, I, I know exactly who I'm going to talk to. When I am at work, I'm already thinking ahead to when I can get back to gaming because I want to get on my Xbox or my PlayStation. And that's totally fine. That's great to have a hobby. The problem is when it becomes ultimate in your life. When it becomes your treasure, because that's where your heart will be also. Y your treasure could be a relationship. There are some of you who, I'm in love. I'm Twitter-pated. She loves me. He loves me. Oh, he texted me. Look at the emoji. All right, you're sick. Um, we don't like you. <laughs> Your relationship has become your treasure, and so your whole heart, everything about you is consumed by swiping right, okay? That could be your treasure. Your treasure, for a lot of us, it's our 401k, it's our checkbook, it's our vacation home, or maybe it's just our house, it's our material wealth, our possessions. That can become an elephant that gets in between you and God. Money can become a god. That's why people get uncomfortable when we talk about money in church, because we're touching their god. In fact, the only people who get offended when the pastor talks about money in church are the people who are not giving any money to the church. <laughs> Let's be honest. By the way, uh, I do not earn a salary here, uh, just in case you don't know that. Um, I'm not trying to fundraise for myself. You're not going to see me driving around in a Tesla it's just not going to happen. I work a 9 to 5, 40 hours plus a week job in sales, in retail, so that that money is freed up to go to missions and ministry. So I don't want you to think that I'm up here, you know, oh, the pastor just wants a raise. Uh, the pastor doesn't get a salary, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, Jesus, however, is concerned about the heart. He's very concerned about what consumes your imagination. And wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So three takeaways that you can write down. Three big takeaways. The first that we get from Jesus' message is this. Our heart is connected to our checkbook. Our heart is connected to our debit card. Our heart is connected to our finances. The finances in our lives try to steal the affections of our heart. Jesus wants our heart. And so sometimes money is the enemy because Jesus is the hero. Listen, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. I'm hoping that people, individuals, couples in this series will experience financial freedom, that you'll stress less and be generous more with time talents and treasures because number two God is generous God is amazingly generous everything that you see is from God it says in the Psalms that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills in the book of James it says every good and perfect gift comes from above God is the originator. God is the giver. God is a good father. He loves to bless his children. He loves to surprise his children. He loves to provide for the needs of his children, not necessarily their wants, but their needs. God is generous. You see this in the most famous verse of the Bible, John 3, 16. This is how God showed his love to the world. He gave gave in your bible you should circle that word god gave 
his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God gave what was most precious to him because God is generous. He's not stingy. He doesn't hold back. God is overflowing with generosity. I know this because uh, I've had children. Children are amazing. Kids are full of life and enthusiasm and passion and, and fun. And they see life through, through these, you know, independent, imaginative eyes. And whether you have children or you come to church here and you, you're, you know, rubbing shoulders with kids, they're a gift from God. And then they grow up to be teenagers, <laughs> which are still a gift from God. He says this in Psalm 127, that children are a blessing, not a burden. And even though you hold your nose when you walk by their bedroom because it smells weird or doing weird experiments with their socks, I don't know, they're still a blessing to you. Even when they don't talk to you, that can actually be a blessing in itself. God is generous. He gives us people in our lives. He gives us money in our pockets. He gives us shelter, your house, your apartment. That belongs to God. He's just letting you live in it, your clothes. Those aren't your clothes. Those are God's clothes. He's just letting you wear them. Your smarts, your intellect. Listen, you and I, we're, we're a bunch of Forrest Gumps, if not for the grace of God. Your intellect is a gift from God. He is generous in your life, whether you realize it or not. You live in America. In the 21st century, you are in the top 1% of people who have ever lived in world history when it comes to being rich. You are rich. And God has given you everything you have. And so number three, we're most like God when we are generous. When babies are born, they come out and they're like all gooey and they look like a squished up Muppet old man, right? And they're like, Wah! Wah! And I always notice that they clench their fists. And then when they get a little older and they start to play, they learn play skills with another kid, they're like, mine, go away, <laughs> right? And that's how we live our lives. We're like, mine. This is all mine. And then I've been at people's deathbeds at the end of their life, the twilight. And that's, that's when they relax because they're about to step into eternity and they can't take it with them. And, and you see them open their hands and relax. And man, if we could just learn that earlier in life, to live open-handed, how much less strife would we have? we were generous like God is generous God gives us stuff to manage to enjoy but he also gives us responsibilities so 150 years ago there's a young man in his 20s William Borden he's this amazing missionary uh, I could go on and on about William Borden all day um, but he inherited millions of dollars from his parents in Chicago he could have hoarded the money and lived a life of luxury and instead he gave it all away to churches, orphanages, and mission organizations. Millions of dollars in the 1800s, early 1900s. He goes on the mission field. He's like 22, 23. He dies before he reaches his destination. And if you go to visit his gravestone in Africa, William Borden's gravestone says, apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. This young man who gave his life to missions, who gave away a fortune, he gave away all his money. And I'm not telling you to give away all your money. That's not the message today, all right? But he was generous because he knew it was temporary. He couldn't take it with him. You never see a hearse with a U-Haul on the back. You can't take it with you. All your stuff, listen, so in December, my mom passed away. It was very sudden, very shocking for our family. And so a week later, we have her um, uh, remembrance, you know, her funeral. And then uh, all of us, the extended family, we go back to the apartment, and, and we have to go through this 
morbid, horrible task of going through her belongings. And it's hard because, you know, you see an outfit and it makes you think of your mom or you see these jewelry or whatever, but you have to do something with it. And so some of it we donated to Goodwill. To, actually, we donated it to a women's battered shelter. Um, and then some, of, some belongings we wanted to keep just to remember our loved one. Um, she didn't take her earrings and dress and necklace with her. There was still some cash on the counter from, from the night before she passed away that she'd put there. She didn't take her $20 bills with her. Like, uh, everybody pull out your right hand for a second and, and make a fist. D don't punch anybody, please. We're not that kind of church, okay? <laughs> We're not angry. <laughs> um, and um, this, this represents a dot. This is your life. Each one of us. God is generous. He gives us time on earth. We get about 70 or 80 years. We get a dot. And then we step into eternity. And, and you go somewhere. And that's another message for another day. <laughs> but you live for what is unseen. You live for what is eternal. Don't live for the dot. Live for what is eternal. We are pilgrims on this earth. We are visitors. We are just passing through. Pilgrims travel light. Because Matthew 6, 21 says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So what does this mean for you and me? Let's get down to the brass tacks. Let's really get that elephant in the room here. What does it mean? It means my heart will always go where I put God's money. So if I put all of God's money into stocks, if I buy shares of GM, then guess what? I'm going to suddenly develop an interest in GM. I'm going to start watching the stock market reports. My, my joy will go up or down based on how my stock is doing because my heart is connected to where I put the treasure, right? Or, or if I put all my money into uh, the Humane Society, then I'm probably going to be that weird cat lady because I'm going to be adopting all these cats and dogs and I'm going to be donating my time down at the Humane Society. Wherever you put God's money, that's where your affections go. And so listen, when you invest God's money into God's purposes in the local church, suddenly church becomes important to you. Suddenly you look forward to Sunday mornings. Suddenly you want to bring your coworkers and neighbors to Life Church to experience what you've experienced because you've got skin in the game. And you get excited because Easter's coming and people are looking for a church and I'm going to do everything I can to get them to come to my church. Because we get excited about, we dream about, we think about wherever we put God's money. And it's God's money. That's the key. A.W. Tozer lived 100 years ago, and he once said, whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. Whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. Giving is the only antidote for materialism. If you want to become less selfish and more selfless, then take the test. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, said, I have held many things in my hands, and I've lost them all. But whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. So what does it look like to put something in God's hands? Well, we've got this book called the Bible. All throughout it, Old Testament, New Testament, there is a principle of testing God. All throughout the Bible, it says, do not test the Lord your God except for one area, money. That's the elephant in the room. In the Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 27, verse 30, it says this, A tithe of everything from the land belongs to the Lord. It is holy. It is set apart to the Lord. The tithe is the first 10% of my wealth. So in ancient times, this was a, a farmer society. So imagine you're in the thumb of Michigan, a bunch of farmers and rednecks, right? They've got a field, they've planted the seeds, and now the first fruits are coming up. The first 10%, they will harvest it 
and take it to God's temple because it belongs to God. That's the tithe. The first 10% of the gross income goes to God's work. While they're away, their field remains unguarded. People could break in and start stealing their stuff. And that's what they had to live on. So while he's away, while he's trusting God with his wealth, he's trusting that God will protect, will bless, will multiply the 90%. And listen, God can do more with your 90% than you or I can do with 100%. So that trust is a step of faith. The tithe is an act of worship. It's an act of obedience. It's an act of testing God. And the question that, that we have to wrestle with is, am I tipping or am I tithing? When I go out to the restaurant, I will silently judge the wait staff. I will silently judge the cook. You know, was my food brought out on time? Was it cooked the way I wanted? Did it taste good? Was it presented well? Am I being annoyed by other people? And then at the end, after I pay my bill, I will leave a tip based on the performance of the wait staff. And then we take that same line of thinking into church world, and we think that's normal. That I like the worship, that it moved me, or were they singing songs I didn't understand? You know, her sound pack didn't work, and so there's this awkward pause. And the sermon, oh my word, he was talking about money? I think I'll just drop a fiver in the bucket. God's not after your money. He's after your heart. Your heart is where your treasure is. Am I tipping God or am I tithing to God? It goes further in Proverbs 3, verses 9 through 10, this whole idea of agriculture. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine. So the first fruits, once again, when he's growing his crops, the farmer doesn't wait for 100% of the crops to come in and then kind of picks and chooses what to bring to God. I'll just bring over some of the leftovers. Or I'll bring stuff after everything comes in so that God's not first, God's last. God doesn't get my first fruits, he gets my leftovers. That doesn't honor God. This act of faith, this act of trust is bringing the tithe, the first 10%, at the beginning, not the end. Worshiping God, obeying God, trusting that he will provide for all of our needs. And God promises blessing when we test him in this area. Now, the blessing he's talking about is not necessarily financial material blessing. There's something in today's church world in America called the prosperity gospel. And it is horrible it is wicked. It is not what we teach here at Life Church. The whole idea is if you give X amount, you'll receive X amount back in your life. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus was about. Jesus said when you put your heart into the things of God, when you tithe, when you bring the first fruits, you will experience blessing in your life, but it's not necessarily material financial blessing. It could be blessing, uh, protection in relationships. It could be blessing at work or in your home life. It could be material blessing. I don't know. God's mysterious. But in whatever way, we walk under an umbrella of blessing instead of under a curse. In Malachi chapter 3, God said, should people cheat God? Should people rob God? Yet you have cheated me. And all the church people said, what are you talking about, Willis? What do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? When did we rob you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. So a tithe is the first 10% that we bring to God. It belongs to God. It's not mine. So anytime I get a paycheck, this is true for Team Heron. I get a paycheck or grandma gives me, you know, 25 bucks for my birthday. The first 10% of that gross money goes straight to my local church. I'm going to test God in this. I'm going to trust God in this. Anything above and beyond the tithe is an offering. 
So we support missions agencies. We support uh, Compassion International, working with children around the world. That's above and beyond the tithe that we bring to our local church. God says, well, you've been robbing me of tithes and offerings. That's the elephant in the room. That's the uncomfortable reality. And so he says, you are under a curse. For the whole nation has been cheating me. And this idea of blessings and curse is found all throughout Scripture when it comes to our finances. Man, I went to uh, public school, and even I know I don't want to live under a curse. I'm going to choose blessing. And so what does blessing look like? In Malachi 3.10, he says, Bring all of the tithes and offerings to the storehouse so there will be enough food in the temple. If you do, says the Lord, I will Open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. So I'm going to open this umbrella. Don't worry. We're not superstitious. We're Christian. And this protects me from the rain. When I have an umbrella over my head, it protects the area around me, right? That's how God's blessing kind of works in a supernatural way. Money is spiritual, when you bring the tithe, the curse is removed. So just normal Joe Schmo, my money is under a curse. This is why I'm stressed out. This is why I'm freaking out because I'm not managing God's money God's way. But there's a way to have fewer regrets and make better decisions. And that is to bring the full tithe in faith, in trust, and God says... I will open up, I will pour out a blessing, a hedge of blessing over you. Now, again, that doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery. You're not going to be driving around a Lamborghini. Here, I'll give you a real-world example of God's blessing uh, in my own life. Because my wife and I, we, we tithe. We tithe to our local church. We give an offering to our local church. Um, and we've seen God do amazing things. This morning, I got a text from my boss. I told you I work a 9 to 5, 40 plus hours a week retail job. Uh, I manage two stores in the Saginaw area. And the, the text came from my boss, just like you have a boss, I have a boss. And the text said, uh, hey, congratulations, I looked at the numbers last month. This is inside baseball for retail sales. I looked at the numbers, and your sales uh, overall were 47% higher than this time last year. 47% higher. Way to go. Add a boy. Now, how do we ascribe that 47% jump in one year? It's not increased traffic of customers because nobody's going to retail stores. Nobody's going to the mall. Mm -mm. They're buying online. We actually have less traffic in our store than a year ago. It's not because our salespeople are awesome, although I think they're awesome. If I'm honest, we're all a bunch of knuckleheads. All right? I'm a knucklehead. You're a knucklehead. Listen, I'm just a, a, a poor person Poor guy trying to tell other poor people where to find bread. That's all I'm doing. So what ascribes that 47% jump in sales? God's blessing. That's the hand of God in my life. That's an area where God has put a hedge of protection and is blessed. Because if my boss is happy, then I have a paycheck and I can provide for my family. And I can serve this church without relying on a salary from the church. That's God's blessing. God says, try it, put me to the test. Try it. Test him at his word. Try it for, I don't know, 90 days. Like, set a Google alert calendar for 90 days and say, I'm going to start tithing for 90 days, even when it hurts, even when it doesn't make sense. I'm going to bring the first 10% to God. through the, And here, even better, if you really are kind of jaded and, and think that this is like a pyramid scheme to, to get money out of your pocket, Try this. Tithe, test God, but tithe to a different church. Same principle, testing God, the principle of the test, but give to a different church. It doesn't matter what church you, you tithe to. I mean, don't give to Hope Bill. They don't need your money. But, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but tithe to a local church for 90 days and see if God won't open up and pour out blessings so great you won't have enough room for it. Now, as for me and my house, our, our heart is here at Life Church. We're excited about our church. We love our church. We want to invest kingdom dollars into Life Church because we want to see more people reached for God this Easter season. So we choose to tithe to Life Church. But whatever it is, 
Just try it. Put God to the test. See what happens. Address the elephant in your own life. C.S. Lewis, 50 years ago, said, Do not let your happiness depend on something you may lose. Don't let your happiness depend on something you may lose. With Jesus, you'll never lose Jesus. Everything we see is temporary. Live for the eternal. Don't live for the dot. Live for the line. You'll never lose Jesus. You'll never lose your salvation. Invest in heavenly resources. Equip God's people to reach more people for Christ. And see what God can do through you. Let me pray for you. Lord God, thank you for uh, challenging us with these words from Scripture. Jesus, it, it blows my mind that you uh, talked about such practical matters, such, such big, big matters that still affect us today. God, I pray that you would um, lovingly challenge us and grant us the faith to test you in this area of our lives. God, would you open our hands, open our hearts, and unleash generosity in the Community of Life Church, that your storehouse might be full so it can do more ministry to reach more people, to rid us of the chains of wealth that cloud our hearts. God, would we be a people that test you at your word, that take the words of Scripture and apply it to our lives in real time to see what you might do through us and in us. God, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to a close, now is your opportunity to partner with what God is doing here at Life Church. Now, those of you who are here and are guests for the first time, please, please leave your wallet in your pocket. We are not after your money, but we would still love for you to go to connecttolifechurch.com and fill out that connection card. Those of you who are wanting to uh, financially support what God is doing here, you can do so in many ways. You can do it on Venmo, you can do it at lifechurchgift.com, or for those of you who are on site, we have baskets that are available that you can drop your offering and your tithes as you walk out the door. We really appreciate you supporting what's going on here and allowing us to seize the moment just like Peter and continue to share Jesus with those that God puts in our path.